A little better. Nice office, Peter. Better. We're going to get started in just a minute. We're just waiting for more people to join. Sounds good. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the 2021 Virtual SMA Conference. This is Colleen McCarthy O'Toole from Cure SMA's Family Support Department. We thank you all so much for joining us today for the Respiratory Care and SMA session. We are so grateful for our national presenting sponsors, Biogen, Genentech, and Novartis Gene Therapies for their incredible support of this year's Virtual SMA Conference. Please note that all lines will remain muted during the session other than the speakers. If you have any questions, please find the chat conversation tab located on the right-hand side of your screen. You can submit questions through that, through that during this session. We would now like to introduce Dr. Taylor with Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, Dr. Shockett with UT Southwestern, Dr. Kuffner with Children's Hospital Colorado, and Dr. Kravitz with Duke University. Dr. Kravitz? Okay, uh, next slide. Well, good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending where you are in the country. We're doing virtual 2.0 this year, and we're looking forward to seeing everyone in person next year at our uh, first get back together meeting. So we're looking forward to seeing everyone's smiling faces. In the meantime, we're gonna keep going on with Zoom. So um, this talk's gonna be different than our previous uh, Breathing Basics talks. A lot of you've heard them, and you can always refer to our Breathing Basics slides back in uh, the Cure SMA website. A lot's changed in SMA, and we've kind of wanted to update our talk to reflect that and have a chance to talk about the questions we see and how our therapy has been changing. So next slide, please. So what we're gonna start out with is some common questions that the four of us frequently get in pulmonary clinic and kind of give you our overview and our answers. And then we're going to open it up to questions. Hopefully the three questions, three or four questions we've come up with are going to actually address a lot of the ones that you already have, but we're going to have plenty of time at the end so that you have a chance to ask your own personal questions. So uh, next slide, please. So question number one, um, what do you call it? We have uh, a, a simple question we get from a lot of families. My baby was just diagnosed early in life uh, with their SMA and quickly started on one of the newer SMA modifying agents. And that could be either Spinraza, Solgensma, or Agresti. Or my child has been using the cough assistant BiPAP, but they've been getting this therapy now, and they're a lot stronger such that I no longer think they need these care. What do you think we should do? Is it safe to discontinue, is it safe to discontinue these therapies? How do we figure this out? So we want to know, are our children having breathing problems? Do they need the cough assist, um, sleep study, and BiPAP? How are they going to handle viruses? So let's discuss this. So I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Oren. You're going to uh, deal with question number one. Hi there, everybody. Good to see you. Uh, and uh, I'm excited to help uh, discuss this topic with you. Uh, so can we go to the next slide, please? So um, what, so some of the things that we think about when we're trying to answer these questions, what respiratory support do I need? How much do I need? Do I need it at all? Is we, we need some data points. So, uh, so I'll go through some of these. Uh, probably the most important data point is actually an interview history um, for, for babies. How much fetal movement was there? Is this a very weak baby? Um, and what, what was our starting point? What was the birth history? Was there respiratory support needed at birth? What about respiratory illnesses as life uh, progresses? Have we had difficulty with respiratory illnesses? Can the baby or child or uh, 
uh, young adult handle their own secretions, talking about facial weakness. And then we ask a lot of questions about sleep, about snoring, restlessness, sweating, um, daytime fatigue, and especially headaches upon awakening that could signal some breathing problems. And we also talk about swallowing function. Uh, the next key data point is our physical exam. So our um, so examining breathing, the chest uh, in multiple positions because the uh, chest wall can change its ability to move and draw air in and push air out based on position. And then we also think about stresses like illnesses, like exercise, if that's possible, like feeding in a, in a small baby. We look at oxygen levels in the form of a, an oximeter probe on the finger or toe. Uh, if we have the capability, we look at CO2 measurements, which is the output of the lungs. Essentially, they get rid of CO2 uh, in order to um, help the body's metabolic needs. Uh, when possible, in kids five years old and older, we try to do pulmonary function tests, and I'll go into that a little bit more later. Uh, we can definitely look at sleep studies, and uh, we'll look at that later uh, in the talk as well. Uh, and you can also refer back to Dr. Kravitz's talk a few days ago about uh, sleep and sleep studies. And then, of course, there are other tests that we can do, like chest x-rays, swallow studies, et cetera. Next slide, please. So um, to be really brief about um, breathing, normal breathing, and then breathing in SMA, we need to understand a little bit about uh, this balancing act between the tones, the tendency of the lungs and the airways to collapse, to shrink down, and the respiratory muscles and chest wall to expand. And that tension between the tendency to collapse and the tendency to expand is where we reach a resting state. So next slide, please. So this is what normal breathing looks like. We're, we have a balanced state. In SMA, we lose our respiratory muscle strength Next slide, please. And so we tip over into a state of where collapse outweighs expansion. And so the, the chest collapses and makes it harder to breathe, harder to draw in oxygen, get rid of CO2. Next slide, please. The goal for respiratory care in SMA is to use mechanical treatments mostly to reestablish the balance between the tendency to collapse and the tendency to expand so that we are in a better position to breathe easily. Next slide, please. Here's another way to, to look at it. So these are cartoons of, uh, of chest movement. On the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see a profile view. And you see the parts of the body labeled there. And then on the right side is a frontal view or at, as we look at each other. Uh, so at the top is the chest, the bottom is the abdomen, the red dotted line is the diaphragm, the main muscle of breathing and then front and back on the, on the left side. Uh, so this is what we look like at rest. The diaphragm is relatively domed. It's ready to contract and pull down. Next slide. So as the diaphragm contracts, you can see the chest gets bigger, the belly, abdomen gets pushed down. And then we exhale again, next slide. And the diaphragm passively rises back up. It stops contracting. The chest gets smaller in size and air is exhaled and the abdomen rises back up. Next slide, please. Breathing in SMA is a little bit different. You'll notice here that we already started with a different shaped chest. On the, on the profile view on the left, you'll see that the chest is narrower to begin with. And you can see that a little bit on the frontal view as, as well, where it's shaped more like an A than um, more of a, a cylinder. Uh, so when we inhale, next slide, because the chest wall and the respiratory muscles are weak, we don't get as much chest expansion. We get a lengthening of the chest, as you see in the frontal view. Uh, and then on the profile view, you see that the chest actually collapses in and can give you what we call a pectus excavatum or a, a sinking in of, of the sternum. And then the belly protrudes. And so we see this paradoxical movement of the chest sinking while the belly moves out. So we have this paradox instead of everything rising and falling together. And then we exhale, next slide, please. The diaphragm rises back up. The chest actually might look a little bit bigger 
And again, so the, now the chest rises and the belly falls in that paradoxical movement. And uh, so you can see how this is not an efficient way of breathing, not an efficient way of increasing the chest volume to get more air in. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit more about um, gas exchange or really the main function of the lungs, which is to take in oxygen and to release carbon dioxide. So in the clinic, very easy to measure an oxygen saturation. It's a simple oxygen probe. As, as many of you know, it can also be done at home. That's a, a very easy thing to monitor. What's harder to monitor though is carbon dioxide levels. There's a few different ways of doing this, uh, but they can't be done at home most of the time in the vast majority of cases. And it can even be challenging in clinic to do it. So the traditional test is a blood gas, either from a vein, an artery, or a capillary. That requires piercing the skin and, and taking blood. Um, that will only tell you the CO2 level at the time of the test. It doesn't tell you about what's happening during sleep, what's happening when, let's say, you aren't crying because you're getting poked with a needle. Uh, there are non-invasive tests that are becoming more and more common, but still hospital-based, sometimes clinic-based. And these are transcutaneous with a, with a skin patch, so no needle or end tidal CO2 measurements. End tidal is through a nasal um, device, so it just measures what's coming out of the nose. So these are ways to non-invasively measure CO2. Those are, like I said, only available in the hospital sleep lab or sometimes in the clinic and very rarely available for the home setting. Next slide, please. Okay, pulmonary function tests. So those kids or young adults who are able uh, to, to follow commands. Um, so usually we say that's five years or older. These are the four tests, main data points that we look at for pulmonary function tests. The first one is vital capacity or how much air can I pick up and move when I take a deep breath and blow it all out, right? How much air is in, how much air is usable in my chest, essentially? Um, the lower that is, we call that restriction. And uh, that suggests to us that there's more risk for respiratory problems. The next two tests are the maximal expiratory and maximal inspiratory pressures. These are really measures of um, specific muscle groups. So the uh, expiratory pressure is essentially how hard can I blow out against a closed valve? And we just measure the pressure. Imagine blowing against a brick wall or, um, you know, the, uh, oh, the, the fairy tale with the, the three little pigs. There we go. Uh, so, so imagine you're the big bad wolf, right? And blowing against the brick house. Um, so that really measures the, um, internal intercostal muscles and the abdominal muscles that push air out forcefully. Maximal inspiratory pressure um, measures how hard one can inhale, uh, how, how much pressure can you generate when you inhale. And that's really a measure of the diaphragm and maybe some of the, the muscles of the throat. Uh, so we can get a, a fine tuned sense of whether there's um, weakness in inhalation or exhalation, or both, is it balanced and balanced? And that helps us think about how to, how to treat kids. Uh, and then finally, the peak cough flow or the cough peak flow, you'll see it both ways. And that's literally how fast does air come out when I cough? This is a hard test to do because most people, when they come to clinic, don't have to cough. Um, and so it's hard to correlate a fake or stage cough with what one might actually do if they needed to cough. Nevertheless, uh, essentially what we do, uh, as shown in the bottom left picture of the young man in red, uh, we, we ask someone to take a big deep breath and then cough as hard as they can into a flow meter and it tells us how fast the air comes out. And there are certain parameters that are based on adult data that suggest when one's cough is weak. Next slide. Oh, I guess that's the end of my part. Um, so I'm going to hand it back over to Dr. Kravitz um, so that he can get us moving forward. Okay. Well, thanks, Oren. Great overview to the types of tests we do in clinic and how we determine what our patients are going to be able to do or not do. And these are very useful data to guide families and 
your providers and making sure everyone gets what they need and we, gives us information if we can add therapy or if we are able to withdraw therapy. So here's a, a good question number two that we often see. Um, my child had a sleep study and it showed low oxygen levels. So my doctor prescribed oxygen. Is that okay? Well, that's a really good question, one we get often. So uh, we're gonna discuss why uh, is oxygen good or not uh, to be added into a patient's care? Do why we get sleep studies, what the sleep studies tell us, and tell us what types of therapies are available, oxygen, CPAP or BiPAP, tracheostomy tube, and how we're gonna monitor your children going forward. And Dr. Peter Schockett will now be telling us about this. Thanks. So um, could we um, go to the next slide? All right, so uh, the simple answer is oxygen is not the answer. But let's go on and talk a little bit more about in depth about why oxygen isn't really the best choice. So simple oxygen doesn't really help weak respiratory muscles work better. It just treats the desaturation. So you're really just doing a Band-Aid over the low oxygen saturation, which isn't really ideal. It really doesn't address the fact that carbon dioxide levels could be going up, which is another way of uh, talking about hypoventilation or underventilation. And in fact, giving oxygen to someone who hypoventilates or underbreathes could make that worse. Uh, next slide. All right. So we talk about breathing support more than just oxygen. So um, there's, uh, there's sort of subjective indications for it and objective indications. So we'll talk about the subjective ones, which talk about signs and symptoms of impaired sleep, potentially um, at the time of uh, SMA type one diagnosis or the very, very weak kids, you make that diagnosis, you see how they breathe and you say, hey, this person needs to be supported. Um, if they're having recurrent pneumonias or persistent coughing episodes, that may be an indication of this. If they're having recurrent respiratory hospitalizations, we often find that the kids that are having recurrent respiratory hospitalizations, when we put them on support, which we'll talk about more in depth, we find that they tend to have a lot less of those. And poor growth can be an indicator that they're spending a lot of calorie and a lot of energy on um, breathing, and that's affecting their um, growth. Now, what kind of objective measurements? Well, if the kids can do pulmonary function testing, as uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Oren, uh, what's your last name again? Oh, Kupfer, that's it, sorry. Uh, Oren Kupfer uh, had talked about your force vata capacity is how much air you could pick up and move. And if that's low, if that's less than 50%, that, be, that could be an indication that you need uh, breathing support, which we'll talk about. Um, if your maximum inspiratory pressures are weak, that could be an indication that you're having problems. If you consistently have low oxygen saturation, whether or not your carbon dioxide levels are low, but if you consistently have low oxygen saturations, that may be an indication uh, to, um, to support that person. And you know, if, you're, if your carbon dioxide levels are high, if they're trending in the high side and that high we consider CO2 is above 45, um, the measurement is millimeters of mercury, then that could tell us that you're not breathing enough, that the person is not breathing enough and may need support. And obviously if you do a sleep study, uh, which um, Dr. Kravitz has talked about, if you do a sleep study and that shows that the carbon dioxide levels are high and the oxygen saturations are low, um, or if there's fast breathing or poor sleep structure because of arousals from not breathing sufficiently, that may be someone who needs some support. Um, next slide. So what about a sleep study? Um, Dr. Kravitz talked about that in, in depth on June 8th, and I would refer to his talk rather than trying to duplicate it, but we'll, we'll hit the highs and lows about that. Next slide. So, when, we, when, you, when you do a sleep study, you're trying to look and see how well people are breathing in their sleep. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to, um, in a way, fix that breathing or assist that breathing or help with that breathing. And so the goals, when you go to sleep, one of the goals are you should be able to get rest. And if you can't get rest um, and you can't get good respiratory muscle rest, then you're gonna be tired and those respiratory muscles are gonna be weak for the rest of the day and have some problems. So one of the big goals is getting good respiratory muscle rest and oxygen, just giving oxygen doesn't answer that. And in fact, CPAP doesn't answer that either, but bi-level positive airway pressure does. And that's what we're gonna focus on. So bi-level positive airway pressure, the important things are that you need to synchronize that breathing with the machine. If you're out of sync with it, if you're 
breathing against it, you're not going to get good rest. Um, you want to see good chest wall expansion when you're using it. If you're not seeing good chest wall expansion, that could be a problem. I mean, some neuromuscular patients, not necessarily kids with SMA, have very stiff chests, and so you don't see that expansion. Um, one of the strategies for um, muscle weakness, which is different than sleep, which is different than sleep apnea, because in sleep apnea they'll often just give you um, BiPAP, which kind of stents open or opens up the, the back of the, the airway in the back of the throat. BiPAP is giving you muscle rest and helping your respiratory muscles. And so we talk about high span BiPAP, which is a, a big difference between the low number, which is the expiratory pressure and the higher number, which is the inspiratory pressure. So kids with um, SMA may have much higher, higher pressures than other people. We may start at 12, um, an inspiratory pressure of 12, but maybe we, we, may, we may go to 14 or 16 or 18. Some kids when they're sick are on much higher IPAP pressures compared to kids that don't have SMA. And we always recommend a backup rate because that allows respiratory muscles to rest. Um, sometimes the backup rate is set low because the people don't seem to need it as much or the kids are more comfortable with a lower rate, but um, we'll often set the backup rate at a couple points below what their baseline respiratory rate is. Next slide. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about BiPAP uh, support for respiratory muscle weakness. So we talk about pressure, we talk about time, we talk about the rate, we talk about the modes, and I've alluded to the philosophy of how all this works, but we're gonna go back through that. So the pressure, there's two pressure settings. There's an EPAP setting, which is this extra positive airway pressure, also known as distending pressure at rest. So when you're, um, when you're not breathing in, there's always some pressure that's sort of forcing a little air into your airways that kind of keeps everything open. And then there's the IPAP or inspiratory positive airway pressure and that helps you take a breath in. So you breathe in, you, you um, initiate a breath and the machine senses that. It's got a computers and sensors in it, senses that and it gives you that breath in and then um, you start exhaling and the machine can sense when you're stopping to uh, inhale and it gives you a positive extra pressure against that. Um, and then some modes have volume. So sometimes instead of giving a pressure mode, we can give a volume mode. So we could decide that instead of giving you um, inspiratory pressure of 16 centimeters, we're gonna give you a delivered tidal volume of 150 mLs or 200 mLs or 500 mLs, depending on how big you are. Um, and we can make uh, different settings with that. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we look at time. So we look at the inspiratory time, how long each breath is. And so we control that. Um, there are some modes that control that, that the computer on the, on the machine controls that, but uh, we could certainly control the inspiratory time, usually 0.8, one, sometimes 1.2 seconds. We can control the rise time, how long it takes to go from end expiratory pressure to IPAP. And a lot of that is a personal preference. So, you know, you may pick the one in the middle, but find out that you want one, two points over this way or two points over that way. And that's sort of a, a little bit about personal preference from the clinicians, but it's really all about the patient. All of this is patient driven. So if you want a faster rise time, God bless you, you can have a faster rise time. If you want a slower rise time, we can work on that too. Um, we could also set the rate. So the rate is really looking at how many breaths per minute. And, and usually we wanna capture, we wanna set it fast enough to capture breathing and improve rest. So um, often we'll have people on a respiratory rate that's uh, a couple points below their normal breathing rate, but sometimes it's a couple point, it's a point or two higher than the breathing rate just to get their, just to capture their breathing. And it sort of forces the body not to initiate any more breaths. And then the machine is doing more of the work and you're getting better rest. Again, that's, that's sort of patient driven. So what about um, the modes? So we have uh, several modes on these machines. The common ones is the PC mode or pressure controlled where you have a guaranteed inspiratory time and there's a backup rate and the pressure is set. Um, and so there's um, with the PC mode, you're, you're um, always getting the same amount of breaths. Um, 
the backup rate kind of kicks in. Uh, I usually use the spontaneous timed mode, the ST mode. So there's a backup rate and you can get um, breaths in between that, that rate. You can get um, more support or less support uh, after that backup rate, or you could set that backup rate high enough that you don't actually have to breathe much. And then another popular mode is the AVAPS mode, which is a fancy term that stands for average volume assured pressure support. And essentially you dial in a ton of volume that you wanna support someone at. So, and usually that's based on their weight. So if you weigh 20 kilos, your tidal volume may be somewhere between eight and 10 mLs per kilo, sometimes more. Um, so let's just say it's set for 200 mLs so that you set in a tidal volume of 200 mLs and then you set a pressure targets above and below that you want it to go to. So you might say, I wanna deliver 200 mLs and I'm gonna deliver 200 mLs with uh, 20 centimeters of water pressure and I might deliver 200 mLs with 14 centimeters of water pressure or 12 centimeters of water pressure. But the interesting thing is that the machine decides how much to give you based on how much you need. So if you have more obstruction or you are in a stage of sleep where you might need higher pressures, the machine decides that and it gives you a higher pressure when you need it. And if at times you need a lower pressure, it gives you a lower pressure. Some people find this very comfortable. And you can also set the EPAP. You can set how fast it's cycling, how fast it understands, or it looks at um, how much pressure you need. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, of uh, computer technology that goes into some of these. And um, some people find that it's a very comfortable rate. It's a very comfortable mode to use because it can adjust to whatever their needs are at that moment. And in different stages of sleep, you may need different um, settings. So usually we like low EPAP and that really allows for good exhalation. People that have neuromuscular weakness don't tolerate high IPAP, high EPAPs. They might not like, they might not mind the higher IPAPs, but that, that bigger um, end expiratory pressure um, can be difficult to overcome. Uh, and in the sleep labs, you have to be careful because they will, sorry, Rich, um, they will, often bump up both pressures as if they see obstructions, if they see problems. And as they bump up those both pressures, they keep bumping up the EPAP. And when they bump up the EPAP, it could be hard to breathe. And then you have people coming out of a sleep lab and they get told that their ideal settings are 18 over 12. And that higher pressure of 12 may look good on that first night of the sleep study, but people that have neuromuscular weaknesses get fatigued. It's, it's, a lot of pressure to blow against. And if you don't have good respiratory muscle strength, it's not a good thing. Plus the obstruction that we see with people with neuromuscular weakness isn't the same kind of obstruction that you see in people with large necks and large abdomens and people that have um, obstructive sleep apnea for other reasons that they're, they're able to generate big negative pressures that have to get overcome. We, we don't have that problem in our patients they're relatively weak. And so the pressures that you have to overcome are not very high. Um, next slide. Okay, so SMA breathing with bi-level support. Next slide. This is what we're talking about. So when to start it? Well, when the vital capacity gets um, to about 20%, that's significant for daytime support. Um, many of those patients may need that. And we'll talk about how to do that. If there's daytime elevated carbon dioxide levels and you can't fix that with nighttime support alone, then that's a problem. If they have daytime fatigue or shortness of breath, that may be someone that needs uh, support. I've had kids tell me, well, I'm okay. I just go to the nurse like two or three times and take a nap for an hour or two on my BiPAP. And then I'm fine at the end of the day. Um, and and uh, those people need daytime support. If you're needing to use your cough assist device a lot, that could be a need for daytime support. And what we have found is that um, the cough assist device actually makes a potentially good ventilator that you can, you could suck on that device and get augmented breaths. And so uh, I've seen kids use that as their, um, as their uh, daytime support. Um, some people need it for speech augmentation. They have a very soft voice and giving them uh, a bigger breath gives them uh, better volumes and, and gives them a louder voice. And some people need some support during meals that uh, they take off their masks or whatever, and they just need a little sip on there. So how do we do this? 
Well, we certainly have patients that use nasal masks and I have um, a couple people that they, they use their nasal mask exclusively. There are these sip and puff, puff kind of devices. They're essentially like a, a straw or they're either a straight straw or they're a straw with a little bend in it. And essentially the machine, you just sort of kiss them and the machine notices when there's tiny drops in the pressure and then it, it senses that and it gives you a big breath in. But obviously some people can't do non-invasive support and that's where the potential for tracheostomies come into place. Um, honestly, I haven't had to do a tracheostomy in a patient with spinal muscular atrophy um, in a while. Um, the type one kids have needed those in the past. I, I haven't needed to, to do a tracheostomy in a type one kid since we've started um, all the therapies, but uh, it's, it's something that's, that's out there. And there are patients with, um, who are very weak, either type ones or very weak type twos, which were the old term I know, um, and they required tracheostomies. But I haven't had to do a tracheostomy on a type two patient in I don't know when ever. Um, and type three patients don't usually need those things because they're much stronger. Um, go on. Next slide. Sorry. Oh, so that is my last slide. And I'm going to turn uh, this back over to uh, the lovely Dr. Richard Kravitz. And uh, he's going to turn it over to Jane Taylor. Thanks, Peter. That was a really great overview, very in depth. And, and I'm always learn something every time you talk. Um, your point, I want to comment, was really uh, spot on. If you're going to have a, a BiPAP titration study or a ventilator titration study in a community lab, you really want to make sure that they know they're titrating a neuromuscular patient, not a straightforward obstructive sleep apnea. And um, if you can't get it done like that, it's really best to go to a large medical center where there's a lot of experience with SMA and Duchenne and other neuromuscular conditions. Okay, third question. Um, <clears throat> another one that comes up a lot, especially in our older kids is, hi, I have scoliosis and my orthopedic surgeon wants to operate. What should I know about my breathing before the surgery? What can I do to make sure that my uh, child's breathing is protected in the perioperative phase? So we'd like to discuss assessing your child's breathing at baseline before surgery, what might be needed in the post-op period, uh, a reminder about bringing your equipment to the hospital at the time of surgery, and how to be a good advocate for yourself or for your child. And to discuss these topics, I'm going to pass the baton over to Dr. Jane Taylor. Jane, take it away. Thank you, Richard. So I get this question a lot, and it's not just before um, a surgical procedure, but really any sedated procedure. And parents ask all the time, what can I do to try and make sure that we don't have any post sedation or post operative complications? There are actually a lot of different things that you can do. So being proactive is really important. Next slide. And first off is if you know your surgery is coming up, alert your SMA team because maximizing nutrition is key. A lot of people say, well, how does nutrition you know, impact how I'm going to do from a respiratory standpoint after surgery. And you have to realize that having good nutrition helps your immune system. And you definitely want to have a strong immune system going into surgery to help fight off any potential postoperative pneumonia. Also, it helps with um, postoperative healing. So if you go in with a good nutritional system, your body can heal better. So it's a good idea to touch base with the nutritionist. Also, from a lung standpoint, you want to try and make sure that you go into a sedated procedure with as little amount of mucus in your lungs as possible. So to minimize the mucus and then the atelectasis or collapse of those airways, which can then trap the mucus and cause infection, there are things you can do beforehand to make sure that you're keeping your lungs nice and clean. So when you go into the procedure, you have a smoother time postoperatively. So first off, assess your equipment needs. Make sure that you have your cough assist, any other equipment in the home that is functioning well, you have your replacement equipment, and you have everything um, that you need to be used postoperatively. Also, if you use non-invasive ventilatory support um, at night when awake, or even if you have a tracheostomy and ventilatory support, Make sure that all of the pieces of equipment are fitting well, especially the non-invasive masks. And 
make sure that your kiddo is using it as prescribed nightly because what that does is it helps keep the lungs nice and inflated. It rests the respiratory muscles and also helps make sure that the cilia, those small little hairs that are moving like guys on a rowboat to get that mucus up and out of the lungs, have enough space to get it up and out and it's not trapping anything down there. This is an excellent time to talk to your pulmonologist to see if you need to make any adjustments to the BiPAP before you go into surgery to really make sure that you're getting fully rested and your lungs are fully expanded when you are sleeping. If you're not using non-invasive ventilatory support at this time, this is an excellent time to make sure you've been screened for any sleep disordered breathing and see if you potentially need a sleep study before the surgery. If you're on any type of prescription medications for nasal congestion, definitely make sure that you have your prescriptions filled and you're using the medicine because remember, any type of drip from above especially when you are sedated for your surgical procedure, can drop down into the lungs. So you want to make sure you're doing everything you can to control that congestion. Also, if there's any type of component of asthma, remember it's not just kind of airway twitchiness and asthma, but it also has increased number and size of mucus glands in the lungs. So you want to make sure that if you've been diagnosed with asthma and you're using inhaled corticosteroids on a daily basis, the kiddo's taking them, and that that's well managed and well controlled before you go into surgery. Next slide, please. So getting a preoperative clinic visit, if you can, is key, but also just giving your SMA team the heads up via telephone call and trying to set up a virtual visit or a conversation um, via telephone is something that absolutely you should do. And if you're doing your baseline airway clearance you know, one to two times a day, this will be increased to four times a day for one to two weeks before the surgery, just to really increase the amount of mucus that you're getting up and out. If you're not doing airway clearance when you're well and just doing it when you're sick, then this is something that you will do one to two weeks before surgery. Any type of inhaled mucolytics, because some of my patients are on hypertonic saline to help thin secretions if they have any type of viral illness um, or re illness before um, airway clearance, you don't have to do that before the procedure because your kiddo is not sick. You're just helping move the mucus up and out. Next slide, please. So different types of airway clearance that you might be using would be um, chest physiotherapy, which helps kind of mobilize the secretions. So you have your hand clapping. You also could use the vest device or in the hospital, you might come across a machine called IPV. And this machine actually does the same thing. It helps vibrate the airways, but instead of someone tapping on the outside of your chest wall, and especially in scoliosis, you don't wanna do that when you've had surgery there or the vest that wraps around and could affect the surgical site. This is actually a machine that either goes through a mask or tube and can vibrate that way. And that's safe to use after spine surgery. What you would find less helpful, especially postoperatively when the kids are on pain medication and are more sedated, would be any of the other types of devices where they themselves have to be alert and taking deep breaths to move the mucus. And these are not commonly used in neuromuscular conditions because the kids just can't take deep enough breaths to make them work. But all of these need to be followed by the cough assist. So next slide, please. And while the um, vest and the hand clapping helps shake the mucus up, our neuromuscular kids who have muscle weakness actually need the cough assist to then help them get that mucus up and out. So it's kind of a two-part um, combined therapy for the airway clearance. And the cough assist is something that absolutely has to be done. And that's the most important part. So remember to do the cough assist after you do the vest or hand clapping. Next slide, please. So what about when you're actually ready to go to the hospital? And there's some key things that you can do to help make sure that when you are later ready to be discharged, everything is going smoothly and you get home on time with everything you need. And the first thing is bringing your respiratory equipment with you. If there are any changes made to your BiPAP or your cough assist settings in the hospital on the hospital equipment, they can then get changed on your home machines at the same time. So when you go home, you have the machines with the new settings and they're ready to be used. You also wanna make sure that your SMA team 
knows that you're going into the hospital because sometimes those surgery dates can change. So keep them posted. And if you have any type of um, sick plan or here at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, we call it the pulmonary action plan, but sometimes it's called a passport and it outlines exactly what equipment um, you use when you're sick or doing extra airway clearance, what settings you're on, all of that is very helpful for the hospital team. So bring that with you. And if you have any advanced directives, make sure you bring that as well. Next slide, please. And what can you expect postoperatively? Well, be aware that the airway clearance is going to increase. And that's not necessarily a sign that something bad has happened. Whenever you're sedated for a long period of time, that mucus does build up in the lungs. And some of the sedation medicines that they use also increases the amount of liquid the lungs produce for a short period of time. So you need more airway clearance. And you will probably see your kiddo using the IPV machine with the cough assist at first up to every one to two hours. That's expected. Over the next day or two, that's going to wean off quite a bit down to around um, every four to six hours. And then over the next couple of days, back to your baseline. So don't be surprised if that happens. That's expected. You'll also probably notice that there's going to be some more frequent chest x-rays and they're looking for any type of atelectasis. And that's where, because the children are sedated and not taking deep breaths, the lungs, instead of fully expanding, can start to deflate a little bit. And if that happens, they can increase the amount of airway clearance to make sure that it doesn't sit down there long enough and mucus builds up to cause problems like an infection. So increased chest x-ray frequency does not necessarily indicate a problem. It means your team is just being very vigilant. Also, expect that when your kiddos are extubated, they will be on some non-invasive ventilatory support. And that is something that could be both awake and asleep. So if you have a kiddo that just uses it, usually when they're asleep, at this point, they could also be needing it when they're awake because they're on a lot of pain medications and they're pretty sleepy and they're just not taking deep breaths. And we need those lungs well expanded so we can get that mucus up and out. So for a day or two, there could be extra use of the BiPAP support, and that isn't necessarily an indication that this is going to be an ongoing problem at all. So don't be surprised if that happens. Um, next slide, please. Okay. I think now it is the audience turn to ask questions. Richard, I'll let you take it away. Great. Thanks, Jane. That was a really good preparatory uh, conversation to tell what, what we tell our families to um, be prepared for, because it's always better to know what you're going into than nobody likes surprises. But thanks, that was really great overview. All right, so I'm gonna turn this over to Jessica, who's going to answer our questions. Uh, Peter and Oren, I think Oren, you said you're having some internet connectivity. Oh, you're good. Let's everyone come off of mute. And Jessica, fire away. Oh, yeah, this is Colleen, and we have a couple of questions okay. here. The first one is, can the team share how to help increase pulmonary function? Okay. And so I, I'll take a stab at this. So um, to increase pulmonary function, obviously if you get stronger, hopefully that increases your pulmonary function. And if things are happening to you that are gonna make your lungs worse, like developing severe scoliosis, then treating the scoliosis could potentially make your lung function better. It certainly would keep it from getting worse. Things that might help would be using the cough assist device for chest wall expansion. So if you use the cough assist device in the positive pressure mode, which is what we often do, well, it puts a little stretch on the lungs and the chest wall. Some people feel that the kids with SMA, the reason why they have um, more lung problems as time goes on, as their lungs don't really grow like normal lungs should. And as a result, um, your lungs aren't necessarily getting smaller. They're just not getting bigger as you get taller. And when that happens, your percent predicted goes down. So it looks like your lung function is going down. But if you put a stretch, a regular stretch on the lungs and the chest wall, you may get better growth out of that. Um, that's what, there are some thoughts about that. And there are some people that are, that are looking at that kind of thing. So I would say um, make sure that you're treating any, you're aware of and treating any scoliosis to keep it from getting worse. Make sure that you're preventing lung infections and treating atelectasis, which is what Dr. Taylor had talked about before. 
Uh, the cough assist can help expand the lungs and expand the chest wall, which may improve lung function. And, um, you know, little things can help. So learn how to play the harmonica could help um, just because it's a, one of these blowing instruments that uh, A, could drive your parents crazy. And B is that it, it encourages you to take deep breaths in and breathe out. And any of those things that might improve your vital capacity or the total amount of air that you move. And I'll jump in um, also, Peter. I tell my families, don't be afraid of using non-invasive ventilatory support at night as the lungs grow. If on some of the sleep studies, we notice that the chest rise, you know, might not be as good. Remember the kids can have oxygen levels that are okay and CO2 values that are on the higher end of normal. So do they really absolutely need support? Maybe not necessarily, but the actual volume of air that they are moving is a little less than what we would want. So they're just not expanding as well. And as Peter said, that means that the lungs might not grow to their um, maximal potential. And that's why if you're kind of on the border of maybe <clears throat> support, maybe not, keeping them on that non-invasive ventilatory support when they're younger might also help with ultimate lung growth. And I know Richard, you probably have a lot to say about this as well. So I'll let you jump in. Okay. Well, it's, yeah, it's definitely um, using your nighttime support when needed. Um, if you're a candidate for it, it's going to help keep lung expanded. Um, I did want to add uh, two comments to what Peter said. I agree with everything he said. Um, we always recommend now that when you're doing cough assist treatments, that your very last treatment end on the inspiration. So you'll take that deep breath in, and then instead of having that last suck out, you take the mask away and let the child breathe out on their own. So we always like to end on the inspiration. And then the one other thing that's important is there are lots of lung recruitment strategies um, using the, uh, your BiPAP or just taking positive pressures from that using your cough assist. The thing is a lot of this is very labor intensive and it requires a lot of ongoing work to get some real benefit. The question is, is it the right choice for you? So I think we always talk about airway clearance. We always talk about BiPAP. In terms of lung recruitment of getting your PFTs to get better, I think this is a little more gray area that we can recommend it and we should discuss it with all our families and you should still feel free to ask questions. But for the amount of work you have to do to get that improvement, it might not be the right choice for every patient at every time. So it's a good conversation to have, but it's not automatic that we recommend that for every single patient every single day. Or Great. Are you? Oh, thank you. Did, um, should we go on to the next question or? Sure. Okay, we had several questions actually. The next one is, do you have recommendations for helping and strengthening secretion management in a trach child who is only needing ventilation during sleep times? We feel the, straight, the trach may no longer be necessary other than having airway access to help with airway secretion and trying to help improve in this area. Oh, Lauren, do you want I'll, to start? Yeah, I can try that one. Uh, one, boy, isn't that a good problem to have? Um, you know, this this is the new SMA where a trach was needed and now maybe isn't. Um, and so um, meeting with your pulmonologist regularly and figuring out a path forward is probably the most important thing to do. Um, in terms of secretion management, you know, tracheostomies can sometimes cause extra secretions to occur in the trachea because it's a foreign body there. Usually that calms down over time, but in some kids it doesn't. So it may actually be contributing to some of those secretions. Um, the other thing to think about is what's happening above the level of the tracheostomy. What about tongue and mouth and throat musculature and strength? Um, if the tracheostomy weren't there, could you bypass um, the obstruction up here with the tongue and, and floppy upper airway with BiPAP and could you, and would cough assist work um, in, in that environment? Um, there's really only one way to find out, uh, which is to cap the tracheostomy and try using um, those devices um, through a non-invasive method through the mouth and nose. Um, and that that's why you need to talk to your pulmonologist and, and develop a careful stepwise plan. Uh, some places will do sleep studies in, in kids 
with tracheostomies <laughs> to see um, if you can cap it and then put BiPAP on the nose and will, will that work? But um, that's, a, that's a more of a regional preference. So point is you have, to, you have to think through all the potential problems very carefully, come up with a stepwise plan with your team and then go forward. Anybody else have thoughts on that? Yeah, I, as a sleep doc, I will say that if your child has improved enough that the cannulation is a consideration, first of all, that's wonderful and congratulations. Um, but two things to keep in mind is that a, a sleep study really can be helpful. It's just one night, but a cap sleep study, if it's abnormal, tells us that your child is not going to be successful. We don't wanna put anyone at risk. And also remember that your child may be doing really well when they're well, but we have to see how they're gonna do capped when they're sick. So we wanna make sure that if any problems come up, you're, you're, you haven't withdrawn therapy that you're gonna need later. So it's something you're gonna work closely with your pulmonologist and with your otolaryngologist. The, the one other thing I'd say is that uh, looking at the anatomy um, with your ENT and pulmonologist would be very important to see what's going on below the level of the trachea, at the stoma, and then above. Uh, all those different areas can play a role in whether or not um, your child can be decannulated successfully. Yeah, and I might but, add that having that, um, that trachea, tracheostomy tube in the airway actually kind of obstructs the hole because now you're, instead of having an opening like that, you have an opening that's got a, something in the middle there. So it, it can increase the work of breathing so it's, it's not always the fairest assessment. And then sometimes it's hard to do non-invasive support through the nose or mouth when you have a stoma there um, because it will leak. So you'd have to put like a pressure dressing over it until it closes. And then there's the potential that when you pull the tube out, normally it just closes up on its own. But if you pull the tube out and then you're doing positive pressure through your nose or mouth, you're going to have pressure leaking from your stoma site. And then the ENTs would have to come in and so it opened, so it closed. But those things are good problems to have. I mean, if you no longer you need your trach because you're you're strong, that's that's a good problem to have. I agree. Great, thank you so much. I think we have time for one more question. We have um, a question that says: In recent hospital visits, pulmonary therapy has been refused to perform chest PT and assisted coughing. I find these strategies far more effective than vibration and coffesis machine at home. Any suggestions for finding care teams in a hospital that will use their hands? Oh, so they want to use the CPT vest instead of CPT with hands. Is that the question? Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. Um, that may be driven by costs because it's probably easier to put a vest on someone and just shake them up than it is to spend the time and really do proper uh, manual CPT. Manual CPT is really an art form. Um, and it's, it's, it can be difficult to do, especially when you have to put people in different positions on the side and prone and, and, uh, and it, it's very labor intensive. And so I, I suspect if there's limited time, they probably just want to put a vest on people. The vest can, in the past, people have shown that the vest at least in cystic fibrosis patients, were as effective as the usual manual CPT. But people that the respiratory therapists and the chest physiotherapists that do this all the time will tell you they get better results from manual CPT, but it's just very labor intensive. And so I suspect there's that. How do you find a team that's willing to do that? I think you just have to be a good advocate and say, look, they do much better when they're doing hand CPT. Um, and, and it may be something that isn't going to get done in the hospital as well as you think it can. And it may be something that if you're better than the care, than the respiratory therapist or the chest physiotherapist at the hospital, that may be something that when your child gets admitted, you have to help perform. Um, just like there are some people that bring their own cough assist devices to the hospital and, um, and they use their cough assist device. Sometimes they can use a hospital's cough assist device, but they're coughing their child more often than the nursing staff and the, and the respiratory therapists are just because they can only, the staff can only come into the room every hour, two hours, three hours, and the child may need treatments every 15 minutes. I don't know. What are other people's experience with that? Well, 
I think this goes back to what Jane was saying about being a good advocate for your child, um, getting, you know, showing what your child's needs are, what your needs are, and then making a case for it, talking with respiratory therapy. Peter's right. I mean, a lot of the lack of hands-on is because of cost effectiveness. Um, there's only so much money to go around and this vest is an effective way of clearing chest PT. But I would just come in and work with the team and come Not up necessarily with necessarily cost, cost effectiveness, cost. Cost. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so bottom line is there's only so many RTs on the floor at any given time. Um, advocate, work, come up with combinations. Maybe you'll do one uh, therapy on your own and they'll do the others with vest. Most, um, most docs, most nurses, most RTs are open to ideas, but be a good advocate for your child. And this is where having a preoperative visit can be extremely helpful because you can talk with your SMA team and the pulmonologist. And I've been involved with a lot of families who have asked for a kind of pre-op care conference where we can also talk with the hospitalist team that'll be taking care of the patients postoperatively and getting a lot of those questions answered beforehand helps you then continue to advocate after the surgery. And that's where it might be explained that they have to use the vest, but would let you do the um, chest physiotherapy. Also, if safe and the surgeons say it's okay from a spine standpoint um, and do that but getting it um, discussed before you go into the hospital is always more um, helpful long-term than waiting until you're actually there. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for this incredible presentation. It was really informative. We so appreciate your time and for being here with the SMA community. We thank everyone who joined in today. There is a survey linked in the session page and you will also be receiving a follow-up email with that survey link. We really appreciate any feedback that you have to share with us. Once again, we are so incredibly thankful for the support from our sponsors for making the 2021 Virtual SMA Conference possible. Please join us for the final day of the Virtual Exhibit Hall this afternoon from 1 to 3 p.m. Central Time. If there is anything that we can do for you, or if you have any additional questions, please email us at familysupport at curesma.org. Have a great day, everyone, and thank you again for joining us for the 2021 Virtual SMA Conference.